I want to, uh, first of all, thank all of our panelists. It's a pleasure to be here with you in this moment. And I want to thank the Boulder Public Library and the Jaipur Literature Festival uh, for bringing this space and making it available for us to have this conversation. And even though we may be talking up here, as far as I'm concerned, we're all in conversation with one another. And also, these conversations will ripple out. You'll, you're all in relationships. You'll meet other people. You'll talk to other people. And I encourage you to do so, because that's the way we heal uh, some of these divides. And um, hello. so let's, uh, we're going to kind of dig into it. Uh, so one of the things that I think we can agree on in our society is that we're polarized. It's one of the few things that we can say we can pretty much all nod our heads to. Uh, would you all be in agreement with that, that we seem pretty polarized? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And so we know that we can't solve this in a single panel, but we do know that discussion is the beginning of bringing people together. And hopefully through this conversation, we can get more curious because I think we need to inject curiosity into the engagements that we have. Many of us think that we have the answers. And so we don't really get into the questions which leave us open to curiosity. So I hope that you leave more curious. And one other thing that if you miss anything, if you zone out, if you fall asleep or anything during this session, I want to leave you with this thought, that there's a difference between fighting and arguing. And, and at least in the context of America, even when we have disagreements, we position them as fights. And the objective of fights is to win at all costs. Whereas arguments, the objective is to get at a deeper sense of truth. And so when we don't agree, it's better to argue because that actually leaves opportunity for openness and peace. So before we get into the questions, just a few norms. I borrow from Edwin Markham this poem that says, uh, he drew a, big, uh, drew a circle that shut me out, heretic rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. So the invitation uh, for this space is that if we do find ourselves becoming polarized or anything, to try to draw a bigger circle within yourself to make room for the differing opinions if they arise. And also um, being mindful that people don't show up for this just to be in disagreement. So we have to try to assume positive intent, even if something gets misunderstood, because that's why we're here is to grow positively together. So is that something we can all agree to? Awesome. So then let's get started. I'm going to start with the question uh, about polarization. So after nearly 250 years as a nation, uh, Kamala Harris became the first woman to hold the second highest office in the land. Her election, of course, is a polarizing event, most especially because if something were to happen to the president, Madam Harris would then become the first woman president, uh, which policies aside for many brings up longstanding global resistance to women in leadership. So here is the question in multiple parts. And um, let's see who wants to answer this first. <laughs> um, would you agree that the founding polarization across the planet is what was historically referred to as the war of the sexes? Kind of saying, is that the foundational polarization in many of our societies? Anyone want to jump on that one? Oh, there's a microphone right there. Sorry. I mean, I think that's a very difficult, um, I don't know, difficult question. Is the battle of the sexes, you know, the foundation of polarization? Um, maybe we can go further than that and say that creation, right, is the foundation <laughs> of polarization. <laughs> the mere fact that human beings are here, mm. that human beings were created, right, then is the foundation of polarization. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe I can add to that, th just taking off from what Chika said, that, you know, maybe the fact that, uh, you know, inside the family, we are always taught from the moment we are born that it's all right for one group of human beings to order and one to obey. And role segregation begins right there. And we also learn while inside the family that there's one head of the family and he's right. 
whether he takes a good decision or a bad decision. And so what that does is it normalizes hierarchy for us. And that then gender digs a trench into our brains into which all other hierarchies fall. So when we go out into the world, we begin to accept the hierarchy of race, the hierarchy of caste, and uh, begin to long for that same head of the family who's going to take all decisions right or wrong, and choosing someone like that in election time. And uh, then we are stuck. So yes, uh, you know, this is something where we have a comfort zone, we are normalized into polarization, and then we suffer because of that polarization, because we, we know it's an unfair system. And we then try to react, and by then we've entrenched it too much, so we don't know how to really change it. And that is the beginning of a lot of things. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I think your question is really deep. Is polarization coming from war of the sexes? I mean, if I understood it right. So all polarization is coming projection of the mind of the, of the person. And whenever there is a duality of the mind or schizophrenia of the mind, uh, whether it's me and, and the rest, us and them, uh, there will be separations. You're going to see the world in dualities, male, female, right, left, uh, right, wrong. All these are dualities. Question is, can we transcend these dualities? So. The war of the sexes is really never a war. It never was a war because one side always wins, the other side always loses. Um, so I, I think we have to reframe that question, but your point is totally valid. I mean, I would take this in a, in a historical direction and just to agree with the point about hierarchy, uh, if you look back, I mean, you have to go back 10,000, 12,000 years, really, the invention of agriculture. We had very egalitarian small band societies as a species and then, I mean, I'm simplifying, right? I've got, I've got 30 seconds here, right? But um, with the development of agriculture and certain technologies, you see the development of cultural norms of hierarchy. And then, as you so eloquently put it, other sort of differences get mapped onto that basic distinction between those who order and those who obey, or those who have authority and those who are subordinate. And, and so I think that there's a very interesting historical uh, narrative and story to be told there that could make all these points consistent with one another. In fact, there's a great book came out about a year and a half ago called The Dawn of Everything. Uh, I, I highly recommend that. It's sort of a creative reinterpretation of the deep history of our species as a sort of horizon for future imagination. Because we, you know, we accept a lot of things that are, um, you know, essentially flexible and fluid and can be altered through, you know, conscious social action, uh, including, I would argue, hierarchy. So. And thank you all for uh, your responses. I also want to recommend a book called The War of the Sexes by Paul Seabright. And that book kind of expounds on that question that I asked, and it partially emerged from that context. And then just speaking from personal um, experience, I was raised by a single mother. And I, one of the earliest conversations I heard my mom having with someone else was her boss. I don't know what he said to her, but I do know what she said back to him. And she said, uh, as long, this is kind of funny, but hopefully it's okay for me to say it this way. I heard her say, as long as you sit on the toilet and your poop stinks like mine, you're not better than me. <laughs> and I said, who is she talking to? Because I, I just heard that one side of the conversation. And then she said, I have intelligence, more intelligence in my pinky finger than you have in your whole body, but the system won't let me express it. And I, st and I was like, what in the world? Who is this lady talking? And then she got off the phone and said, I just got fired. <laughs> so then I knew she was talking to her boss. And it really struck me because I realized that there were so many systems that wouldn't let my mother fully express her potential. And that is part of what informs me asking that question because I often, my mom now has dementia. And so I know that she will not in this life have an opportunity to manifest her highest potential, um, as far as I understand it. And I believe that if the systems were more fluid, she might have been able to navigate it better. So thank you for answering that question. A question about social responsibility. So uh, the background for this question comes from Jonathan Haidt, who's the author of The Righteous Mind. And he says that 7% uh, seven, uh, 7 of the extremists on either side, and let's just 
we, for the moment we can think about left and right. So he said 7% of the extremists on either side are fueling the apparent division. Unfortunately, he believes that an overwhelming portion of the 86% of folks and the exhausted majority, so I, that's a term that we use in, in the bridging movement, we say the exhausted majority. Um, the, so the exhausted majority uh, of folks have unwittingly contributed to what he calls structural stupidity. And this occurs when this majority of otherwise smart people who for fear of reprisal from their own side go silent on issues that may cause conflict rendering the system effectively stupid and affectively polarized. So here's the question. Assuming that John Haidt is Jonathan Haidt is correct in his observation, if someone in this audience were to identify as part of the ex exhausted majority, what would you say to them to encourage them to contribute their voice to the social and political systems in an effort to overcome this structural st stupidity that exacerbates polarization. So what would you say to folks that said, yeah, I'm in that exhausted majority? I would I say that there are two kinds of people in the world, those who think there are two sides to everything and those who don't. <laughs> so uh, which one is easier to be in? And also, where does this resentment come from? If they can just think for a second, be more mindful to begin to hate a fellow human being for whatever reason, because of their sex, their race, their religion, uh, even because they are migrating from a different country in search for food and shelter. So where does that impulse for rage come from? And uh, try to deal with the rage because that is where the hatred begins rather than dealing with the person. And of course, I can always quote Gandhi that an eye for an eye will leave everyone blind. Anyone else want to touch that? Um, I mean, I'm part of the exhausted majority, mm. you know. Um, and I was thinking today, and I'm going to, and I'm just sort of going to talk specifically about the United States, right? That between 1990 and 2002, right? So, and 2020, so between 1990, if I'm not wrong, and 2020, right, that the GOP has won only one, um, what's it called? So you have electoral Electro. college and then you have the, um, general the, the general, the what? The popular vote, no, I'm talking about popular vote, right? No, yeah, and so, and yet, so, and that was in 1994, right, when Bush won um, John Kerry, it was the only time ever between you know, 1990 and, and 2020, right? You're a political scientist, yeah. And there is something very annoying about the majority voting, for, you know, for, for a particular party and then lose, and then the minority being the ones taking all those decisions because of the way that the elections are run, right? So I can understand that fatigue if you think that your votes don't matter, right? And we had that in Nigeria recently. So um, now if you don't know this, Nigeria just had elections and the person that was projected to win, P2B, for all sorts of reasons, most of them illegal, <laughs> right, um, came third. And I know so many people who were very motivated to go out and vote because they wanted to vote for change. They were tired of Buhari and they wanted change and P2B sort of represented that change. People that I know that hadn't voted in years stood in line. People were beaten and they came back and stood in line to vote. Only at the end of the day for INEC to announce somebody else as the winner. So I sort of understand that Apathy, the apathy that comes from um, imagining that you, the apathy that comes from your votes being suppressed in any way, whether it's by, you know, gerrymandering or um, election reforms or um, electoral college or whatever, or rigging or people running away with ballot boxes that hap like happened in Nigeria, like people were like physically carrying ballot boxes and running away so that those votes were not counted. Right. Thank you. 
Um, I mean, this is an interesting question, and I think I would differentiate between engagement, engagement within the formal political system, you know, elections and representative offices, and engagement within sort of civil society. Uh, because I think engagement within civil society, there's a little bit more space for the nuance and the ambivalence to sort of come out, and it's less zero-sum. I think when you engage in the formal political system, especially in this country where you have an electoral system that's... Um, you know, basically re reduces down to two parties. My, I mean, my uh, personal, not my professional advice is you, know, you kind of have to hold your nose and vote for the least uh, insane candidate. And, um, <laughs> you know, recognize somewhat that, that the formal political system is, um, um, is, a, is, is a holding cell for, for people that uh, have, uh, you know, outsized egos, right? And it's not always the case, and there are exceptions, but we, we do have to acknowledge, I mean, one of my favorite authors, Norman O. Brown, says, you know, madness is in the saddle, and we have to acknowledge that there are limitations to how much sanity we can get from our formal political system. We still have to engage with it, right? We still have to engage with it to sort of minimize the, the insanity uh, that is out there. Uh, but I think we should avoid uh, putting too much hope that it's just going to become uh, a fully functioning, sane sort of system um, because it has these sort of incentives towards groupthink and tribalism and other sorts of uh, modalities that make our engagement with it pretty fraught, I would, I would argue. I mean, again, a complex issue. But. So, um, usually, my approach is whenever I look at this polarization, I'm very confused because sometimes I agree with one side, sometimes I agree with the other side. And so the question is, can we be involved without taking sides which are rigid? Sometimes there are positions that uh, the Republicans will take that I would like because I am uh, all for individuality, so fundamentally I love, I love that concept of individuality. But I love the, the liberal approach allowing people the freedom allowing people to be who they are conceptually. These are all conceptual uh, issues, environmentalism, I, saving the planet. So can we be engaged without being divided in our own heads? That is usually the challenge. Uh, the problem is we love to take positions. We do not have to accept the binary of either being a Democrat or a Republican. I think that is, if, if it is possible to do that, uh, then we can be engaged. And engagement is not that difficult anymore, fortunately. You have far more avenues today than we even had 10 years ago. You have social media, you can engage with people. Every, what should I say, every idiot has an opinion on social media right <laughs> now. We need some people who are able to research, who have some sanity, who have some balance, who are able to see the truth in each side and then voice opinion. We have lost the ability to have a normal discourse. I cannot even uh, have people talk to each other without yelling and screaming, and that's really a, we need to get out of that trap. I mean, I cannot watch any television uh, shows anymore because all they do is yell at each other, no one listens. And so can we bring that habit of listening and a thoughtful, deliberate look at, and you will never be 100% of right. 100% right. This concept of being right itself is wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can take that, I, there may be a beginning, I, 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 perhaps. Thanks. I once wrote a piece called 80% is the new 100%. And it was just this assume that you've got 20% of anything you're thinking wrong, and that should be good enough, uh, just to leave room for wonder and curiosity. Um, before I go to the next question, I was actually raised, and a lot of people are, are surprised about this when they find out, but I was raised on the right. So I was raised Republican um, and grew up with everything that you can imagine, down to being promise keepers, all stuff. I was in all of that. And I was personally, in my context, it was enriching for me because I was in a context that tried to make me be in a group think and I took the fundamental notion of personal autonomy uh, to a certain level that pushed me out of that context. But then when I tried to take the personal autonomy to the next level, then the group I was in said, not that personal, you can't have those opinions, <laughs> you know? And so then I ended up in this, you know, 
just nebulous place. Um, but from that nebulous place, I was able to see multiple dimensions of, of what you're saying, what you're pointing to. Um, you know, broken clocks right twice a day, and there's a lot of broken clocks out there, so eventually we can get all the, the times right. <laughs> uh, so the next question is actually about uh, media and its responsibility for the experiences uh, of polarization. So qualifying background. In his documentary, uh, The Social Dilemma, American technology ethicist Tristan Harris demonstrated that many of our social media platforms are essentially polarization engines where division entrepreneurs are rewarding, rewarded for pitting groups against each other and fueling outrage. So here's the question. Through your personal and professional lenses, uh, what effects have you observed regarding social media's impact on polarization in America? Has it fueled it or has it simply brought to our attention what was always present uh, for a long time, hidden under the veneer of social politeness? Why did you go first instead? We are now able to handle bad manners as we never could in the past. <laughs> I mean, if there's one thing one can say, yes, it has allowed someone like me, I can put my opinion across. And, and be counted, hopefully, if someone will read it. Perhaps there is a glut of too much that is being said, but that's a different issue. I can put my opinion across. But we are allowing bad manners as a norm. And if something we, and I don't know if we can ever fix it, but perhaps if we adopt a simple standard that we will learn to respect the other person, if it's, if it's such a bland statement, but if we can learn to respect ourselves and the other person, that itself may be a good start because we need to recover that habit of discourse. Social media has definitely made us worse in our expressions, but it has given us a platform that we never had. And I think if we can just realize that, maybe we can use it a little more responsibly. Uh, well, I'm not on social media because I find it anxiety provoking and I, I'm, a, I'm a college professor and a lot of my students, I see the anxiety on their faces uh, and just their, their general comportment with it. I think there's something about the uh, compulsion to present yourself in, in, a, in a way that is public, but you don't know how public. I mean, I can see all of you here, we're presenting ourselves publicly, but when you're, you're putting something into the Twitter sphere or whatever, you don't exactly know who's going to see it, but you know it's susceptible to being seen. And I think that that creates a certain psychic strain or, or pressure um, that, you know, again, causes us to, to build up walls within us and to be defensive. And it, it, it's just not a space, as far as I can tell, I mean, uh, maybe there are exceptions to this, where you can actually have thoughtful back and forth discourse without it sort of devolving into name calling and the, the kind of worst of things. So um, I, I haven't yet seen the, the avenue toward it turning into a, a, a healthy direction. I'm, I'm, uh, but maybe some people who are on social media can, can correct me on this. But. So I love social media. Sorry, you were going yeah. to say something. There are some good uh, mm -hmm. uh, handles. And there's a lot of, I learned a lot about things from social media that you, I would not recover from books. Sure. I mean, there is that sense of things get more revealed. You're able to see more and access more. And I think that is, that is certainly, you can, be, can be a positive uh, thing. I mean, I absolutely love social media. Right. I'm on everything. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I joined Blue Sky or whatever. Um, so I do love social media. But social media is also a space where you can fall into the temptation of curating um, lists of people that think like you. And so you're not hearing dissenting views. And it's also a space wherein you can very easily block people. So somebody says something you don't like, you don't engage, you just block the person and that's it. So you can spend hours on social media just reading things that validate you. And it doesn't matter what you say. You can wake up today and write, I think that Michael Jackson is still alive and lives on Mars. And you will find people who agree with you, right? So, and that's the danger of social media, that it doesn't matter how stupid or ridiculous 
you know, your opinion is. You're going to find somebody or a group of people validating you for whatever. Maybe they're as stupid as you or they just want to, you know, I don't know, right? But, and, and social media has also helped with the um, spread of, of fake news, right? There is nowhere that fake news spreads as quickly as on social media. I mean, there was a time that all I did was tell my mom, no, that's not true. Nobody, no woman in Germany had, you know, half dog and half human baby. Because people would send out these things, right? And then she'd say, oh, but you know, but there's a photograph, I saw a photograph of it, right? I'm like, no, that photograph is photoshopped, right? And so that's also the danger in social media, but we, you can't live life risk averse, right? You have to take those risks. And you can't, on the one hand, believe in freedom of speech and freedom of whatever, and try to um, curb somebody else's um, freedom to stupidity, right? Um, so yeah, and that's me. And I'm like Chika, I'm on every social media because I'm an activist and I have to communicate and I want to communicate to as many people as possible, and especially the younger generation who are on social media. I grew up as a journalist, so um, you know I was taught that you have to verify your source and you have to go to the spot and get two fact checks done on what you do. And the, problem with social media is you don't have to do any of that. So exactly what Chika is saying, you can say anything. Now, um, those of us who are trained in journalism can sift through the lies and the truth and say, okay, this seems more credible than that, this is coming from here. But a lot of people cannot. And what that has done is, uh, you know, there are multiple polarizations happening at the same time. So it's not like two sides, there could be many sides. And uh, in the work that I do on sex trafficking, for example, uh, you know, there are sex predators. And so they are preying on young people on social media, putting up fake profiles and with AI now and chatbots and all of that, right? Then there are the fights between those who want uh, pimping and prostitution to be legal and uh, brothel keeping to be legalized and those who don't, who think it's violence against women. And so there's that fight, there's that kind of polarization and they will put up nasty things from photographs of genitalia to anything. And then on religion, for example, uh, because I was a journalist in India during the rise of um, nationalism of, by the majority, Hindutva nationalism as we call it, uh, and if I would comment or respond, there was the complete backlash because in many places, countries themselves are funding agencies who are sifting through data and phishing. And so you're actually engaging with a machine and you don't open, even know it. So the polarization is who? Who are you fighting against? So both in the sex industry, I've begun to realize they're all chatbots. Mm -hmm. And same thing I've begun to realize uh, with a lot of the Hindutva stuff that I take on, that I'm dealing with a machine. So now the way I use it to get beyond the polarization is to say what I have to and leave it at that. And then there's a thread and people can comment. And because I believe in freedom of speech, I don't obliterate anything. But I don't think that social media is the cause of polarization. I think the cause of polarization is much deeper than that. As you know, race has existed before that. And we didn't know all the manifestations of it, right? Uh, caste sexism, all of that has existed before that. And um, the life of my grandmother was definitely worse than my life. So things have improved, they haven't gone back. And uh, so we have to understand that what social media is doing is only what we are, it's reflecting what's happening in our society. And that's something, and we can use it to build alliances as well, like we did during the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm where we actually just hashtagged and there were people all over the world who understood the power and came out and spoke. Mm -hmm. So um, this is election year both in India and the United States and the polarization is going to become more uh, rampant, ramped up on um, social media obviously. Uh, but you know, we'll all fight with our bodies really, the color of our skin or our wombs this time. And uh, you know, it's not going to be affected by social media. It's going to be affected by our own lived experiences. So thank you all for those answers. Um, once I got, came across an article and it said that the, the Pope, Pope Francis, this was when he had just become elected, um, that he 
had written something like an encyclical that said that he saw the value in all religions and all faiths and all these things. And I was in a, in an interesting space in my own faith journey. So when I read it, I was excited and I said, man, this is pretty cool. It doesn't sound like something a Catholic priest would say, but I'm, uh, I'm excited he's saying this. And then I thought to myself, hold on, it doesn't sound like something. You just say, let me look. And even though it was a really good article and a positive article, article and it had been spread, it wasn't true. It was also not a real article. And I felt the sense inside of myself that I wanted to be validated by this opinion of a pope that I had no relationship to. I'm not even Catholic. Um, but I wanted that and I witnessed it inside of myself like, oh, I wanted this person to validate me and I wanted to share this because it was a validation of myself. So I stopped, checked it out, realized, and even after I realized it was fake, I sort of wanted to still share it anyway, but then I didn't share it. And I said, no, I'm not going to share it because it's not true even if it's positive. So there's some dimension of, I think, looking within oneself and asking ourselves the questions um, of what arises in us when we share things across social media and across platforms. What are we trying to uh, create when we contribute? And then being a witness to that, and maybe that would be a way of uh, social media manifesting differently. I don't know, but that's just a two cents. So this is a question about social stratification. Um, by many, America would be considered a multicultural society, which some would call a strength. However, in her book, uh, Creolizing, Pro Creolizing Political Theory, uh, reading Rousseau through Fanon, author uh, Jana, or Jana Anna Gordon describes a feature of multiculturalism as different cultures coexisting relatively separately, which takes no significant leap uh, of the imagination to see how this could contribute to greater polarization. In contrast, she describes Creolization as people reinterpreting themselves through interactions with one another across cultures, something we see very little of in our society outside of certain institutions, uh, such as sports teams and sometimes the military. So here's the question. Using the definition of creolization as people reinterpreting themselves through interactions with others different than themselves, uh, what do you think it would take to creolize the American political system so that we could, like many creolized cultures, uh, pull from the most accessible and beneficial aspects of our diverse citizenry. It's kind of long, but I'm, did, did we catch that? I'm processing it. He's going to go first. Yeah. I'm going to go first on this? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, like, you know, again, I, I, I have a di differentiation in my mind between formal political systems and political cultures and, and the social and uh, I, I think this is a great point about social media. Social media is a reflection of, of, of who we are. Our, our political institutions are a reflection, a distorted reflection, but a reflection nonetheless of, of our society, of our culture. Uh, so as, as culture creolizes, and I think that is a, uh, it's not the only possible outcome by putting people of different historical backgrounds and traditions together, but it's, uh, it's, it's one possible uh, outcome from, from that. And um, as society creolizes, I think our political institutions will necessarily have to create more space for that um, or risk a sort of uh, what we call in political science a legitimacy crisis. And I think how does a society or how does a culture creolize? Uh, I mean, you know, there are events like this. There are opportunities to meet people from different walks of life and different faith backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds. And I do think, you, I mean, again, I'm a skeptic about uh, doing this in a mediated sense. I think you have to develop relationships with people from different backgrounds. I think you have to develop relationships that sustain over time in order for that sort of uh, exchange essentially to take place. And so if we think we can do this through our phones or think we, think we can do this in a mediated fashion, I think we're, we're probably mistaken. But I do think there are uh, ever greater opportunities for identifying people that you can build relationships with across across difference. And there are great bridge, bridge uh, organizations such as Unify and others that are, you know, dedicated to creating spaces for conversations across difference. So I think the opportunities are out there for sure. I also think, you know, a lot depends on political leadership because if political leadership drives hate, then it does polarize people. And I've seen this in India and I've seen this in United States, the two countries I live in, in both places. Um, you know, they do uh, make 
statements against minority groups, leaders in power, and just yesterday in Indian parliament, there was a member of parliament who was using curse words against Muslims. Now, all of us think that's not possible, and you know he's going to be treated as a fringe, but there are people who are watching him and thinking, oh, he's very strong, and he's very macho, and he's saying it like it is, go man, right? And he gets away with it, and then 10 more people begin to think like that because he said it in parliament with impunity. So uh, the culture of this kind of polarization based on hate is actually created, I think, in the last decade. I've seen, noticed, and even before that, through some political leaders who are cynically trying to polarize to get power. And, uh, you know, we have to understand that if that is what's going to happen, then how do we protect ourselves from that? So, um, you know, we just discussed this, that, you know, the, gov the democracy may seem like hypocrisy because there are some people who benefit more than others from it. You don't feel you can participate enough. But you have to choose the least evil because if you don't engage, then there will be somebody who will take over who'll take over even that possibility of engagement. And that is really something which is looming right ahead right now. And we have to really think about it because we can say, oh, we don't like politics. And a lot of my friends have begun to say that, right? But you know, if you don't find politics, politics will find you. And then it'll be too late. Yeah, my favorite expression, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu, right? <laughs> so, so be at the table. So I think the way uh, we can do it, each one of us, is to creolize ourselves right away. And that is the challenge. That is a difficult thing to do um, because we are so right. I am right and no, pun intended. So a politician in South India made a statement, we should destroy Sanatan Dharma, which is the majority religion, because it is a disease. And then more words were used. But see how selective we become in how we process information. Uh, because just like the statement in parliament was wrong, the statement made by the son of the chief minister of a very important state, perhaps the most prosperous state in the country, was wrong too. Yet we take sides, so immediately we have polarized ourselves. How do we get out of that trap? Because just because that parliamentarian is wrong, just, and we accept it, we should in the same breath say that the other statement to destroy a whole religion was wrong. Are we capable of doing that? And that is an answer that has to come from each of us. It's easy to take sides subconsciously just because we think we are right. I don't have any disrespect for the US or India. We are in, I, these are the two countries I love more than any other countries in the world. And the reason is we are spoiled. We have so much freedom that we don't even know what to do with. Yes, there are problems, major problems, no one, no denying that. But the fact that we can discuss it, try doing this in some other countries, you would not be doing this. Now that makes, brings us even, mo brings even more onus on us to behave properly and creolize ourselves. I would use another term, but creolization is fine. Okay, I don't know what the term you would use, but Chica. Yeah, so I was going to go into a whole spiel about you know 1619 and slavery and and how you know american democracy you know actually came about because of slave trade right it was the slave trade that gave them money to um to break away from the most powerful empire at the time right and it is interesting that we're having this conversation now you know many years after slave trade wherein the books are being banned and that history of slave trade is being revised and whitewashed. And I don't know that we can talk about creolization if we're not ready as a country. And I'm American now, so I can say as a country, if we as Americans are not ready to reckon with our history, with the history of slave trade. No. I just wanted to add one comment because 
I just have to. <laughs> so, and you know, also the other thing is that, uh, you know, yes, it's very important to stop the binary within from happening because our first relationship is with ourselves and then we can come to terms with everything around us. And to do that, we have to listen to ourselves and then listen to others. But also it's very important that while we are listening, we have to make choices. And you know, it's not enough to say you can be both a Democrat and a Republican. Ultimately, you will have to be in the ballot box and choose something. And you have to choose that uh, for yourself. And that's where you have to listen to yourself and make choices based on reality. Also, the other thing is that what about ism, you know, is something which we all encounter as we go about it. That, oh, you've talked about this, but you haven't talked about that, so what about that? But the context and the reality of these things are something which we also have to evaluate. That is it the same or is it false equivalency? When people present two sides of the same coin, it may not be two sides of the same coin. And uh, so um, we have to think about who is getting hurt the most, what are the stakes here, and what should we do about it when casting our vote? Because polarization is going to be around in the coming year for elections. May I just one? Real quick. So if I may uh, disagree a little bit on that. Polarization in voting is not a polarization of mindset. We may have to choose one because of the process, but that doesn't mean our awareness has to become polarized. And that's exactly the point. We need to be open, and which is what we are doing here right now, talking about it, dialogue, discourse, engagement, the ability to disagree, to tell to your, to your face, I do not agree, yet do it with utmost respect for each other. So. Yes, we may have to choose one or the other at the time of the election, but before that, we don't have to mentally be tied down in that paradigm. We may choose not to be either or, and that's maybe Absolutely. a way to approach. Thank you. So we want to leave time for a Q&A from the audience. Um, so right before we do, we have a venue manager that's going to have a microphone. And um, I want to thank you all for this portion, for participating in this portion as you have. And then if you have a question, I would just ask that it's actually a question. Um, and I know sometimes people will say, I have a question, and then they tell a story, and they go, and that's about it. So if it's a question question, then yes. OK, well, then I don't know what to say. But I'll just <laughs> <laughs> But what I wanted to say was that, um, OK, I'll pose it as a question. So I think it's a brilliant um, um, metaphor, creolization, and I wonder whether um, the panel thinks that social media, despite all its flaws, is probably a medium that will actually allow us to do pol to do creolization, because we are able to say I'm not talking about people that say stupid things, but I'm I'm talking about people who are able to go past gatekeepers who won't let us talk and express our views. That's oh, a good question. Absolutely, yes, I, I do agree with that. That's my short answer, yeah. Because social media gives you, there's an immediacy to it, right, and accessibility to it. And people sometimes do have those conversations that they can't have, you know, face to face because they're not in the same space. So social media absolutely does um, encourage your enhanced cruelization. Unless, unless it's uh, used by corporates or by governments, which we noticed during the last election when um, you know, Facebook was used by Caterpillar, Cambridge Analytica and things like that. So it depends. Well, and I won't disagree, but I'll just say it's nece maybe necessary but not sufficient. You know, again, I, I think that relationships are uh, over time are, are the only way in which we can sort of alter our path or our trajectory, right, and, and, and build on more aspects of our identity or our personality. And I think as, as, as wonderful as the engagement with, with difference can be across uh, social media platforms, I think it's relatively thin unless it's, unless it's taken up in the sort of relational parts of your life. That's what I would say. So uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan had said the medium is the message. So the medium, the way it is, if I have only 240 characters to express myself, then either it's going to be totally idiotic or it's going to be the greatest aphorism of all time. Uh, the medium <laughs> is the message. But we can go beyond it. I think we, there's, it's, that's not the only medium. There are other media and, and best media medium is face to face, talking to each other as you have already pointed out. But I think that it can be a 
mean, it can be the first step because we see how you know the world is changing. 20 years ago, nobody would tell you that they had a friend in China if they hadn't seen that person face to face. Some of my kids' kids say, oh, you know, I have a girlfriend, and where is she? Well, she's in Thailand. Well, how often do you see? Well, we haven't met, but we've been dating for eight months. So, you know, so for them, you know, life is, things are changing, and the way that we sort of navigate what is real and what is not real is also changing. It's, it's like blurring. And don't forget the fear of technology, the, the obsession that people have with technology uh, with and of course now AI is coming and augmented reality extended reality we will not be forget face to face so uh, use it for what it's worth and then shut your phone so we have to move to some other questions someone over here has the microphone all of you have uh, very admirably expressed your support of the First Amendment and for freedom of speech what do you feel about Elon Musk letting Trump back on Twitter? Make a choice. I'm okay with it. I mean, I've blocked him, so I don't know when he posts, right? <laughs> um, I do think it's dangerous to, um, I mean, I do think that freedom of speech isn't, it's not limitless, right? So your freedom of speech doesn't have to hurt somebody else. But I don't believe in banning people. I don't believe in censorship to a certain degree. And so, yeah, Trump can stay there and do whatever he wants to do, right, and find his, find his tribe. Who's going to decide? Is, yeah. do, we, do we give Elon Musk the power to decide? Yeah. Whether, and before that, uh, the so other team, they next, were deciding you know? it. So it, either you give, freedom is freedom. Freedom to be stupid is also freedom, and if we're going to go for freedom, let allow that. And that's dangerous, but that's the only chance we have. You know, there's a story that Gandhiji used to say, and I heard it from my father. So apparently, uh, there were two people walking on the street, and one man used to swing his arms like that, and it hit the arm nose of a man coming from the other side. So the man said, please walk properly. So he said, I have the freedom to walk as I like. So the person who was hit said, your freedom ends where my nose begins. And go to another question. Oh, okay, right here, has a mic. First of all, I just wanna thank you for being shining examples of what productive conversation with differing opinions can be. Um, so thank you for that. Um, actually on my way here, I experienced, you know, someone called me a racist just because of my cowboy hat. Mm. And, uh, I'm sorry, and then I, I didn't saw mean this, to do that. Man. And then I I'm saw sorry. this, oh, you're good, man. Um, and then I saw this on the, on the list of the schedule and I said, oh, that's amazing. This is, what, what a great opportunity to ask this question. But um, in my experience, the most powerful thing we can do to end polarization is to step outside our own opinions um, and our own triggers, which are so rooted in trauma. Um, and understanding our triggers. And then once we've understand our own triggers and our own trauma, how do we step outside our own experience to ask someone else about theirs and step outside of our own culture? What would you say to people who are living in triggers and trauma that keep them from stepping outside their own views um, to be inspired to then um, step inside of other cultures and other views and other religions and other races to experience their culture and their music and their food and their language and learn to appreciate that, which brings us so much closer together. So I'll, st I'll start with that because it's a local experience that happened here in Boulder. Um, there was a vigil, candlelight vigil, uh, for both for people, unarmed black people who had been killed by the police and for police who had been killed when in Texas the, there was a man who was shooting police officers some time back. So we did a vigil for both. Um, and there was a man who showed up for the vigil and every time, uh, hopefully he's not here today and if he is, I'll give you a hug. But uh, he, every time we said a name of a black person that had been killed, he would say something disparaging. And uh, so it made some people upset and so I came up to him and I said, I know you're scared, but could you please just, if you don't agree with the black vo voices, don't say anything and just 
honor the police officers, if that's what, all you can do. But he couldn't help himself several times, so several times I said, I, and I always said, I know you're scared, but, and then, he, and then he, he would, we would have the same kind of conversation. And then at one point he said, why do you keep saying I'm scared? And I said, because I've been scared before and my face looked just like yours. And then he stopped. And then he was silent. And then afterwards he sat down with some of the students who had sponsored the vigil and had a conversation. And I don't know what happened in the conversation after that, but I think being able to honor and acknowledge that most of what we see in other people, we've mirrored in our own experiences and being able to not have shame and disdain for our own weaknesses and vulnerabilities, but to acknowledge, hey, I've been weak too. Hey, I've messed up too. Hey, I understand what that's like. Or I know people who have, I have proximity to people. And that then becomes a way of holding an invitational presence for that person to not feel isolated and alone. Because most of the time we're doing that out of a sense of isolation. So if you say, I am with you, and the person hears you, then it comes down. So that's my experience, and it was local. So, does, who else, does anyone have a oh, mic? Oh, she has a mic right there. I have there, a mic. So. Is it on? Yes, it is. Okay, I wonder what you all think of this. This is not my original thought, but I have read that because issues are so complex, environment, um, social issues, that a lot of, this is a very thinking crowd, but there are hundreds of thousands of people who really don't want to wrestle with tough issues. And I'm wondering if you think the complexity of today's issues leads to more polarization and leads to people just kind of agreeing with somebody who has a strong opinion because it's a whole lot easier than trying to analyze the complexity of the world today. That's it. You want to go? Uh, I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, the experience of complexity can be can be overwhelming, and then you look. There's a there's a desire for simple solutions, and uh, you'll never go uh, bankrupt in politics offering simple solutions uh, or easy solutions, right? So, um, I, I think there is something to that. I mean, you know, then you have to say, well, what's 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 the alternative to that, or what are alternative? Uh, alternatives to that. One is you try to break down the complexity. One is you try to create context for conversation about that. Um, but but yeah, I mean the the issues that we're confronting cannot be summarized in a sort of political slogan or or statement often. But that's how we mediate our politics in a in a large society, right? That, that it has to sort of be succinct, right? That the messages have to be sort of shrunk down and succinct um, in order for them, for them to travel widely. So it, 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 it is a, a wicked problem, um, but uh, I think that the, the more awareness you build around the complexity, the more you make complexity okay, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and give space for, for, uh, for working through some of that complexity, the better, for sure. I wanted to add that, you know, that politicians know this and they exploit it, right? Which is why, you know, the person who shouts the loudest about, about the parties being in a cultural war wins, you know, gets, gets, more, gets more votes, right? They're not talking about policies, they're not talking about, you know, how to make life better in any meaningful way, but they're talking about, you know, transgenderism and they're talking about um, whatever else, right? And they've managed to convince voters that what we are in, that we're in, you know, culture war, and that their side is better than the other side, but they're not talking about real, you know, policies, right? And someone, um, a friend of mine and I were talking once, and we were just, sort of, you know, saying how difficult life was. And my friend said, you know what, I wish I were really ignorant, because... I'll be so much happier. Like I'd wake up and nothing would bug me, right? So if you don't think about complex issues, it just makes life a lot easier. It doesn't make life better, but it just, it just makes your life a lot easier. Uh, things seem to be more complex, but the fundamentals remain the same. And the fundamentals of human existence and consciousness, the fundamentals of taking responsibility and beginning to think in a more subtle manner of changing oneself, uh, I think remain the same. I think it is a responsibility 
we have to have to look through all these smoke and mirrors and go to something deeper where the problem lies. One last question. Oh. Uh. Oh, he had his hand up earlier. I'm sorry, and then Mike never made his way to him, and he had it really early in the beginning. I observed that. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. I'd actually like to make the case for increased polarization. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> let me define Take the mic away. No, I'm joking. Contrarian, contrarian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me be a little bit contrarian here. So uh, my view of the polarization in the U.S. right now is that it's essentially a continuation of the Confederacy. Mm. And uh, that we had a big war over that. And uh, uh, had the, the North uh, kept troops in the South for, say, 50 years, not 10 years, or maybe 100 years, I think we'd be better off as a country. Right. And I think we would have been able to suppress uh, what I consider, I, I consider Trumpism ju just to be a continuation of that. Uh, and uh, so I think there's times in history when you have to fight, you know, where you can't, uh, you can't uh, have a sensitivity training. Mm -hmm. and increased communication like you know i i don't think i could have in, uh had had you know my ancestors jewish ancestors in eastern europe tried to communicate better with the nazis i don't think that would have done them much good you know and so i sort of view the contemporary situation in the u.s in that optic not, and let me give you an example, Obama. Because of time, we, we okay. might not be able to get Let me give you thing. one concrete example. Obama was, uh, we are not red states and blue states. We are one United States, and he got elected, and he found out that we were red states and blue states, but his reaction was not to rally his very large popular movement that he had when he was elected, but rather to govern like a moderate Republican. This was a huge mistake that Obama made, in my opinion. He should have been more polarizing. He well, should have rallied his troops and tried to smash the <laughs> far-right fascist Republican party. So yeah, we, thanks for your comments. And it's probably, I know sometimes getting to the question might take a little bit of a journey, but I appreciate you sharing your opinion and where it's coming from. Um, it's we're a, at time, so I don't know if you... You can't equate present U.S. to Nazi Germany. That It's not the same. You, the fact that you can talk here is... is yeah, you I should talk in Weimar, Germany. You could not have... Nazis you would not have stayed... I could have talked like this in Nazi Germany with the Weimar during the Weimar Republic. So we're at this time... I, uh, this is part of being human, and... Um, Feelings come up, and we are all kind of trying to manage it. And I, I really appreciate the energy that's being lifted up. It's something we can't fully address in the moment. I'm willing to stand on the side uh, after, but the, this session has to end. So I want to thank everybody who has. Thank you. So thanks, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. That's a lively end.